invite you to join us for a half hour of inspiration, sharing, and teaching in a new program of Orthodox Christian Renewal. This comes as an outreach of the Logos Ministry for Orthodox Renewal, headquartered in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The founder of this ministry of faith is Father Eusebius Stefanu, Greek Orthodox priest, author, and evangelist, who's been called by God out of pastoral and professorial posts to proclaim the end-time message of salvation, healing, and deliverance in Jesus Christ. Father Stefanu comes to share a message of love and hope with both those who've never known Christ and those who are already members of the church but have never experienced the fullness of God's redeeming grace and healing power. At the close of the program, we will give you the address where you can write our evangelist. And now, our speaker and host, Father Eusebius Stefanu. Welcome to the Hour of Orthodox Christian Renewal. It's a real joy to be with you again. It's time for fellowship, time to come into the presence of God and to seek Him for our various needs. I'm going to minister God's Word in the uh, half hour that's ahead of us. And I'm asking you just to join me and to enter with me into that divine presence. I just want to tell you today that God loves you in Jesus Christ and he wants to meet your every need. God isn't someone up in space, but he's close to you in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the answer to all your needs, to your physical needs, to your spiritual and emotional needs. Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago for the whole man. This is what orthodoxy is all about. And I'll tell you, friend, today that my God is a God of miracles, a God that does wonders, and it's only then that you feel like praising God. When you don't know God is a God of miracles, you just don't feel like praising Him. Now, before we go on in this program, I would like to ask you to help me to spread the word about the television program, to tell your friends about it, to get the word out. I'm asking for your help in this regard so that I can believe that the time and the money we're investing in this television program will really produce results. So please help me to spread the word and uh, tell your relatives about it, your friends. This is the way that we could come into the home of our Orthodox people and minister the Word of God and bring that renewing power of the Holy Spirit to them. Because this is the burden that God has laid upon my heart. There's a growing need in the church today for preaching more of the Word of God. And like the apostles and the church fathers did, they preached, they loved to preach. They didn't only do the liturgy on Sundays, but they spend weekdays preaching the Word of God. We cannot expect our church to survive, least of all to be re renewed without, uh, if we don't move beyond uh, a 10 or 15 minute Sunday morning sermon. Because the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing. So if there's not enough faith today in the midst of our Orthodox people, it's only because they're not hearing the Word of God. So we've got to get the Word of God out. And I, I have a sense of urgency about it. I, I can't understand it, but God has put it into my heart. He's ignited a flame in my heart, a fire. Time is running out. I believe Jesus is coming back again. We need to preach the, the, this mandate. This is the mandate of, of Christ. And, and the Lord has put a, a very deep, a very strong, intense desire in my heart to preach the Word of God more than ever before. The Apostle Paul says in uh, the epistle to the Corinthians, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Uh, I can't take a chance. I, I, I'm going to answer to God someday. Uh, did I, have I preached the gospel as much as I should? I, I'm going to be judged by God. I've got to give an answer to the Lord. And that's the way I feel today. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I like the other uh, passage in the Apostle Paul where he says, For Christ sent me. Christ sent me. Why? Not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. This is what has priority. It should have priority in the church today. 
in, in, in addition to the sacraments, we need to preach the gospel. Otherwise, the sacraments, as I pointed out in a previous message, otherwise the, the, the sacraments uh, are reduced to just something uh, formal. The Apostle Paul uh, says in the Epistle to Romans, first chapter 1, verse 16. And I want to read uh, this particular verse to point out the priority of the gospel here. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How many of us can say that in the church today? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I believe, my friends, that, that this is God's hour for the Greeks and for the Greek Orthodox. And that God is pouring out His Holy Spirit upon all the churches today. And I believe that God is not leaving out the Greek Orthodox. And that He's pouring out His mercy. He loves the Orthodox people. And He's moving in the midst of the Orthodox and touching lives of men and women. So I'm asking you to join with me and to share in this burden, especially if you're an Orthodox, and even if you're not an Orthodox, if you're a Christian of another church, God might put that burden upon your heart. I know today there are many uh, Christian believers that have a burden for the conversion of the Jews, for example. I believe the Greeks also, in a way, uh, historically speaking, have a historical destiny uh, among all the nations that the Greeks fulfill a special role in history for the spread of the gospel and for the Christian dispensation. And I think God is working out something very special for the Greek Orthodox. I think of that passage uh, in the epistle of the Apostle Paul where he talks about bringing the gospel, you see, to the Gentiles. Remember that the Greeks were among the first Gentiles that received the gospel. And Paul said, or, or rather God spoke to Ananias when he was appointed to uh, minister to Paul at the time of his conversion. God told Ananias, minister to, to this man, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. So the Apostle Paul had a very deep sense of ministry and of, and of mission to reach out and to preach the gospel. Now, in Greek, gospel is evangelion. That's the Greek word, evangelion, which literally means good news, a good announcement from two words, ev, which means good, in Angelia, which means announcement. There's something very good about the gospel, something very, very important, very urgent, very uh, joyful. This is why the night when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, those shepherds of Judea had heard from the angel that announcement, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. That's what the gospel is all about, good tidings. It concerns a great joy. And the angel said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What's the joy all about? That the Savior has come. This is what the joy is all about. And the word evangelize, means to announce good news, the Greek word evangelizome. And then there's the other word evangelism, evangelismos, from the Greek word evangelismos. It's a scriptural term. It's an orthodox term. And uh, in the orthodox church, the four gospels are contained in that one volume called Evangelio, which is usually placed on every altar of every orthodox church. So evangelism is not a word that's strange to the Orthodox Church. Some people in the church think that evangelism is associated only with Protestantism, but it isn't. 
That's what orthodoxy is all about. It's all about the gospel. So if you want to be a real, authentic orthodox, you've got to know the gospel. You've got to know the glad news. And once again, what is the glad news? For unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And remember when the archangel Gabriel brought that announcement to Mary that she would bring forth, that she would give birth to the Son of God. Well, that event is known as the Annunciation. In Greek, Evangelismos, because it involves a, a joyful announcement. And remember when the angel spoke to Joseph in a dream, and he said to Joseph, she, that is to say Mary, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The essence of the gospel of the good news is salvation. Why is the news good? Why is the announcement so joyful? Because as the angel said to those shepherds, for unto you is born this day a Savior. That's what it's all about. For he shall save his people from their sins. What makes the gospel so good and so needed? And what is the urgency about getting the gospel around? It's salvation. That's all it is. In one word, salvation. You might ask me, salvation from what? Well, as the angel said, from their sins, and he shall save them from their sins. What is a sin? Sin is the universal condition in which man lives. Man was born into this state of sin by virtue of the fall of Adam. Every one of us are born under the curse of Adam. It says there in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And David in, in Psalm 52 says that, in iniquity have I been shapen, and my mother has conceived me. In, uh, in sin has my mother, in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, you see. This expresses the reality of universal sin uh, in, in man, among, among men and women throughout the world. It's a universal condition. And we read in the epistle to the Romans, Chapter 5, verse 12. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All men are sinners. We are all born sin sinners. We are born under the curse of Adam. We come into this world under condemnation. In other words, an eternal separation from God. We come in pain and sorrow, inheriting simply eternal pain and sorrow, and eternal anguish. We come into the world uh, in sorrow. It begins in this world with birth and not only continues, but grows worse and is intensified as man grows without God, without salvation in this life. And that sorrow reaches its peak of intensity beyond the grave in a state of torment. And Jesus Christ calls that state the unquenchable fire of hell where there is the gnashing and grinding of teeth. And the Bible talks about all men and women under sin as children of wrath. No one is born as the child of God. In other words, adoption, sonship is not a birthmark, but you have to acquire it in Jesus Christ. We are called children of disobedience when we are in sin before we come to Jesus Christ. And the lake which burns, we read in Revelation, with fire and brimstone is the second death. And that's the fate of all those who not only are born in sin, but remain in sin and in rebellion against God. So sin really is a state of disobedience. It's an offense and an insult against a God who is holy and just and righteous. Sin is in opposition to the very nature 
of God. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. Now, the word death refers not only to physical death, but primarily to spiritual death. Death in the Bible ordinarily refers to eternal separation from God, and that is known as the state of torment. And those men and women who are consigned to hell, the Bible says, are tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what hell is all about. And I just wonder, dear friend, if you know the plan of God, how God has planned to save you from this eternal fate of damnation. So there's good news. There's the gospel. There is the evangelio. I bring you glad tidings of great joy, that is to all people. I mean, what greater joy can there be than to know that there's hope to escape such a terrible eternal destiny, dear friend? There is, in fact, assurance that you're going to escape it. There is certainty. Isn't that wonderful to have that certainty? So listen to what I'm going to tell you. While fallen man was deserving of condemnation, God devised a way conceived of a plan whereby he could save man from such an eternal disaster. That's why the Apostle Paul says that the wages of sin is death. But on the other hand, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now that's the gospel. That's the good news. For unto you is born this day a Savior. There is hope. There is a Savior, the Son of the living God, and He's brought salvation into the world. That's, what's the, that's what the gospel is all about. In other words, friend, you don't have to spend an eternity in torment, in separation from God. God sent His Son into the world to take your sins and my sins and to take that condemnation and to die for you, Jesus Christ, he is your Savior. You don't earn salvation. It's a gift. It's given to you by grace and by the good pleasure of the Father. Grace is simply unmerited favor. This is a supreme gift that God may, makes available to you today. So gospel means that God forgives you in Jesus Christ is his son. That's why the Bible says, in him, Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And it also says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, Dear friend, it's not because you are righteous and good that you receive this gift. Remember that. Sin is imputed to Jesus, but on the other hand, righteousness is imputed to you. The Bible says, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who know no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Jesus Christ. Now remember that. Not in ourselves. The righteousness is imputed to us we do not have it inherently in ourselves. There is a supreme exchange, in other words, that took place on Calvary's cross. Jesus took upon himself what was due to us. Adam's curse, condemnation, disease and death, all the evil that was due to us. Jesus exhausted Adam's curse in his own body. You and I take the blessing, on the other hand, that was due to Jesus. Righteousness, life, divine health, and finally, glory beyond the grave. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? That's why the Bible says there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's not how much you do for the church that's going to save you and get you into heaven. It's not how, much, it's not how good you are and how much money you have donated to the church or how many times you wash the dishes at the church dinners. But it, it's to know the gospel and to receive 
that gift of God. Now, St. Simeon the New Theologian says, Christ came not to judge, but to save him who believes from the heart, and not by works, nor by toil, nor by perspiration, but only by faith in him. And I, I'm quoting from this illustrious church father to show that this is very orthodox. Some people think that to stress salvation by grace is something Protestant. St. Simeon says that salvation is affected in the believer, not of the works of the law that no one might boast, according to the divine apostle. Works are not necessary. I mean fastings and vigils or rigors and hunger and thirst. And St. Simeon goes on and says, Indeed, I am emboldened to say neither fa fastening the body with irons nor afflicting it with hairy skins is necessary. Such things are nothing at all, since even many criminals and those who are poverty-stricken endure these rigors. Well, I don't have time to finish this uh, quotation, but I want you to uh, just think. Just think about God's gift and receive it. St. Simeon says that what God wants is a broken spirit and a humble and contrite heart. And to go to the Lord and say, Who am I, O oh my Lord and Master and God, that you should come down and become incarnate and should die for me so that you might set me free from death and corruption and to make me a partaker of divinity. And St. Simeon says, When you talk to the Lord in this kind of attitude, you will find the Lord embracing you mystically and kissing you and putting a right spirit within you, you see. So, my beloved... I'm asking you before the close of the program to make a conscious, deliberate, free decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you want to be really orthodox, that's what orthodoxy is all about, the gospel, salvation, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's an experience with Jesus Christ. It's a life-changing meeting with God. And I just want to end this program today with, with a prayer. I want to pray for you. Maybe you've never experienced the reality of Christ in your life, even though you're a church-going member. And I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your head, to open your heart to the Lord as I pray this prayer. Jesus, I pray that you would touch that man, woman, boy, or girl that is within my hearing voice. Make yourself real to them. I claim them for your kingdom. Jesus, don't let that man, don't let that woman die before he's saved in Jesus Christ. You are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with me today. May God's richest blessing be with you. This is my wish and my prayer for you. And I trust that you will join me next time. Please keep this program in your prayer. Write me. We thank you for having joined Father Stefano in this new broadcast of Inspiration and Faith. We hope you will tune in again next week for another half hour of Orthodox Christian Renewal. This program is made possible by the free will offerings of the viewers. Your prayerful and financial support is vital to the continuance of this telecast. 